Welcome everybody to another episode of the Nonprofit Show. We're really excited because this is Friday. This is the day where we, we get people in the hot seat and we have them work with us on our Ask and Answer. People from all over the world send in their questions. Today's very unique because what we're doing is we are having our guests from the Dave Thomas Foundation for Adoption on to answer some questions. And some of these questions um, have come in throughout the week and will kind of relate to what we've been chatting about. So I want to welcome back Rita L. Sornan, President and CEO of the Dave Thomas Foundation, Jill Krumbacher, Senior Vice President of Marketing and Development. Yes, you heard that right. Marketing and <laughs> development. I'm going to say that again because it's just fascinating. And then, of course, I'm Julia Patrick. You know who I am. Um, we want to make sure that we thank all of our presenting sponsors who've been with us this week Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, your part time controller, Be Generous, Fundraising Academy at National University, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Thought Leader, and the Nonprofit Nerd. Again, if you want to find any of these episodes, they have been riveting. Uh, check us out on Roku, YouTube, Amazon Fire TV, or Vimeo, and all of those are transferable. So if you see something and you want to share it with your board or coworkers or your neighbor down the street, you can do it through this. And then podcasts. We have been pu putting all of these episodes into podcast format for about the last year now. And so... All of this content is consumable wherever you like to queue up your podcasts. Okay, you ready? Ready. Oh. <laughs> okay, this is really interesting. This came to Rita and it says, Rita, how many people ask you to serve on the Dave Thomas Foundation uh, for Adoption Board? Or is it a case that you are always having to search out prospective board members on your own? Rebecca from New York. That's a, it's a great question. And we do, over the past few years, we've had more and more people reach out to us and ask if they could be on our board. Um, and so we actually have a nice queue in the ready of people and, and we're constantly going through what are the, the skills that might fill a gap on our board. Um, are people really interested in being on the board to engage or to, to fill a resume? Um, and so we do a lot of that work ahead of time with folks to talk to them, engage their interest and understand. Typically it's somebody that has a personal connection to the cause and so they wanna do more and we love that. But yeah, we have people approaching us about being on the board. Well, I would, um, I would identify you as a prestigious board because it, it's uh, a national, you know, it has a national presence. And then also because it's a grant, a granting organization. Yeah. Um, again, the topic, the topic is amazing, but I, I would think those two kind of push you out front. Would you agree with that? I, th I think so. And I think particularly we've, we've really, I think, established ourselves as a brand um, in across the nation. And so people notice, yeah, the Dave Thomas Foundation for Adoption. They understand maybe a little bit what's that connection with Wendy. So we're still in a, an explaining mode at times. Some people think we're a corporate foundation. Some people think we're a family foundation. So how do I get involved? And it surprises them when we say, no, we're a national nonprofit public charity and we have to raise funds like everyone else. But yes, we make grants. We, we implement programs. And and so I think that variety of what we do is enticing to folks as well. And this is from me. This is a question that I have as a follow up. How many folks on your board are directly tied to the Wendy's corporate structure, you know, aside from fundraising, but just within that leadership? What does that look like? Because you, you told us. You have 24 board members? Yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a fairly unique situation because of this strong relationship with the Wendy's company. Seven designated positions are corporate positions, and they tend to be the C-suite positions. So the CEO, the CMO, the chief communications officer, those folks are on. And then we have seven positions for franchisees because so much of our fundraising is in the franchise community. Yeah. They make independent business decisions for their franchise. They carry the brand. They've got a lot of agreements in place with the corporation, but they're independent business people. Mm -hmm. um, and then we have two Thomas family members that sit on the board, two positions reserved for them. 
and then seven more positions for outside members, people that don't have any connection to um, the, the, the Wendy's brand. So we've talked about that a lot. You know, at some point, do we need to reduce the number of corporate positions, franchise positions, increase the number of public positions? We're in a, a sort of evolution conversation stage about that. We don't want to diminish, of course, our relationship with Wendy's, but do we need that strong of a presence when perhaps we could mm, uh, have a benefit by having more public members on the board as well? Um, you know, I was just, while we had that little pause, I was just reviewing with our viewers and our listeners. The Dave Thomas Foundation has done something which obviously blows my mind because I bring it up every time we're together, <laughs> that you have combined the, the leadership of both development, fundraising, and marketing and put them under, I'm gonna use the word chief, one chief, one director, um, which I love, I am amazed by it. I, I can't believe that it's, it's successful as to the degree that it is just based on the amount of work that has to get managed. But I love, love, love the, the mental direction of it. And so Jill, we have a question um, that's come in for you. And Jonah and Richard from Chicago write, we've noticed that you are leading both development and marketing. Is this normal or is this a temporary situation as the organization grows? <laughs> um, it is not a temporary situation. Um, it is a, um, a purposeful decision for where we are right now. Will it be that way forever? I don't know. Um, but it is not like a short term where we're trying to find somebody right now to fill that role. No, it's been that way for the last eight years. Um, and, and I think, you know, that our plan, as long as we're in the stage of fundraising and brand building that we're in, I, I think one of the reasons why it works so well for us is we're doing very public, broad, nationwide fundraising and brand building at the same time. So while we have good brand awareness, we may not have as much brand awareness as, say, um, uh, you know, the American Red Cross or St. right? And in order to do as much fundraising as we need to on a nationwide level, we need to have really high brand awareness. They work together. And what we found is a lot of the work that you do to build your brand awareness brings in funds. And a lot of the spend you do on public fundraising nationwide builds your brand. And so when... Right. When we are trying to discern on our metrics, <laughs> is this a marketing thing? Is it a fundraising thing? I mean, we're able to do it. We're able to say, okay, the purpose of this is fundraising. The purpose of this is marketing. But the truth is both work together to do both things, which is bring in funding and bring, you know, build that brand awareness of the organization, which you have to have. And it's just very difficult to separate mm -hmm. um, for us. And so, you know, if you're more of a chapter organization and you're doing more one-on-one -on -one fundraising or regional fundraising, maybe that's different for you, but we are just in a place where um, it's hard to separate them, so we don't. <laughs> you know, I, I think it's brilliant. No, I, I actually think it's brilliant. I think it's really smart. Um, I am a very small donor to your organization because I was so moved when I, we first met Rita. Um, and so I, I'm very, very privileged to see what you do, how you market to your donors. Um, and, and I think that all too often we see a disparity between the marketing messaging and the development messaging. And sometimes it is at a loggerhead and it, it so how I see how you function is, is like top drawer. This is the way it's like a masterclass in what you should be doing. What I can't get my head wrapped around is how you do it. I, I mean, that's what, where I get, I'm just like, how does this get done? Like how many people do you have on your team? We have a total team of 20, including myself. Um, and you know, those are fairly, we have a large marketing team that's supporting that fundraising team. So you absolutely, we have, I think three 
sections, you know, we have two different development sections, one fa focused on our corporate partnership, one focused on that non-corporate partner partnership of that um, broad public fundraising, and then the marketing team that supports all of that. They support other departments as well, of course. But um, so we, I have a leader of each of those things, and they are high level functioning leaders. Mm -hmm. um, Right. And so um, making sure we recognize them as such, um, it's true. And without them, I can't stay in the weeds of it all. I have to stay up at a strategic level, ask the right questions, push things in the, you know, the right direction for our traffic control, keep mm -hmm. things in tune. Um, but I don't do it all is the answer to your question. I stay aware from a high level strategic perspective and results perspective. Um, but we have a great team with strong mid-level leadership. And Julia, Ed, we're constantly pulsing. Jill and I talk a lot over the years. Is this still working mm -hmm. in this direction? We need to pull these apart. Mm -hmm. And as we look at it and as we think about it and engage goals and successes against those goals, it's worked well for us so far. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, just being on the other side, um, it is beautifully done. Your work is beautifully done. I mean, if you open up an email at eight o'clock in the morning and then you go onto the website two days later and at three o'clock in the afternoon, you're going to see a consistent thread. I mean, the pieces are from coloring to typography to messaging. Um, it's very consistent. So I think it works. Again, I just get like holy moly how does this get managed because i know i know what this takes right i mean and so that's to me the exciting thing to see this um before we go on i have another question and i hope this is helping jonah and richard from chicago everybody knows an afp the association of fundraising professionals reports that the average tenure and it just breaks my heart to say this of a fund development uh, director or high level manager is only 18 months. Where are you with that trajectory? Are you holding on to your fundraisers or what does that look like for you? We, oh, thank goodness we are not. <laughs> Those statistics all the time and it's frightening. You're just up to speed on an organization and how to fundraise by the time you leave. Um, and we are not anywhere near that scenario. Um, I've been here eight and a half years and my, the, the leaders that report to me, um, one has been here longer than me um, and the others are all five to six years um, that they've all been in place. And so I think what's really important for me is I wanna be sure to hang on to those people. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. Now the same going for marketing. I mean, again, just putting the perspective of the um, the shifts in labor and and the, the type of labor you need because you've got to have more digital uh, oriented marketers coming into your team. What does that look like? How's that pipeline for talent? Great question. And we talked uh, yesterday, I believe, a little bit about how that can be a little bit more of a younger hire or a little bit more of an entry level hire than your fundraisers. And on our younger end of some of those digital, um, more entry level types of positions, we do see more turnover there um, as they are really seeking to climb the ladder, um, you know, and fast forward their careers. They're the ones who will hop on other, you know, external opportunities with a little more speed. And so uh, um, candidly, yeah, we have seen a little more turnover in that group. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. Well, you know, uh, Jill, this makes me your comment about how you've been able to retain your your fund development team. It almost seems like it dovetails back to how critical it is to have a positive, strong environment, you know, That's throughout the whole sector. So, you know, congratulations to you because that's where you're seeing it show up. Um, okay, these are always my favorite when we get a name withheld from Los Angeles, um, California. They come from everywhere. And I'm going to woman up, sometimes I will take somebody's name off because if I think it's like, oh, you know, I don't, I don't wanna do that. But this came in as a name withheld. So. As the time moves further and further away from people actually knowing Dave Thomas, the founder of Wendy's and the foundation, 
do you see issues with telling the founder story or does this matter? You know, we kind of touched on this a little bit earlier in the week. Rita, what say you, my friend? Well, it's critical to continue to um, talk about the legacy of Dave Thomas. He's in our name. His family is on the board. We're here because he was linked to this cause. He was adopted. Um, and so it's important for us, I think, no matter how far away we get from that name, that we keep that persona alive, not just the name. Um, and so that people say, oh, Dave Thomas Foundation for Adoption, it could be XYZ organization. But that behind that name is his story and his, his link to this cause. So we hope to, you know, at a very basic, we keep him very much alive on the website. Mm -hmm. um, we always start with major presentations, always start with who we are and why we're here. We're constantly talking about that, but not in a way that's overburdensome, I don't think, but in a way that respects and honors the legacy. We would not be doing this work and children in foster care would not be getting the care that we can give them without Dave Thomas. And so I think it's it's especially on my shoulders, on the board's shoulders, on senior leadership shoulders to make sure not only externally that people understand who Dave Thomas was and why he's so important to this cause, but internally as we bring new employees in who may be younger, who may have never seen a Dave Thomas commercial or may not even eat at Wendy's for all we know, right? They need to, make, we need to make sure that they understand the legacy behind this name as well. Now, Jill, tagging on to this question, um, do you know what the Wendy's Corporation is doing or how they're going to keep the Dave Thomas name alive so that you have some bridges there? Or do you work in concert in some form or fashion with that? We do. We work with them quite a bit um, and we can see strategically and they invite us. They, they open the door to us. Nice. We get to do their, you know, annual conventions and things like that. So we get, you know, we, we get a position of being able to hear some of their strategic plans and things like that. And so we do see what they're doing to keep um, that message alive. Um, and I think for you and I, what we talked about a little bit last week is the places where we can tell that story and where it's harder to, and it, we can tell his story in our long form, you know, in our web materials and our blogs and things like that. In the short form things that we're doing, it's harder to get that in because we have so much to explain. But one place that's been helpful for us is, you know, it, we might get new donors in through short you know, form digital ads, but once they're on our newsletter list or on as a donor with us, we send a series of communications at that point. That's the new donor series, right? And that's that education point that they get in an email a week out, and then they get another email two weeks out, and then they get them. And then that's where we can come back and sort of bring them into, oh, and by the way, <laughs> Dave Thomas started this whole thing and um, use that as an education point. Do you think that folks don't necessarily know the link. I mean, like they, they've heard the name, but maybe they don't know. I mean, your branding, your color scoping is the same as the Wendy's brand. Um, right. But do you feel like maybe there's a percentage of folks that are like, oh, I didn't know that. Or, or do you have any sense of that? There is definitely a percentage of, of folks that don't know that. And both uh, we measure that and so does Wendy's, by the way, as, as their, our, their cause of cho choice. So we stay on top with research to know how many people know of that linkage uh, and, and how many don't. So we are aware. <laughs> I love that. Fa good for you. That's, that's absolutely fascinating. Well, Stephen from Miami, Florida writes in, Rita, how do you and the board discuss or work on C-suite leadership succession planning? Is this a tough topic or one that is normal for the board? If they're talking about it, do they include you? Oh, what a good, what a good question, huh? Well, my first answer to that is yes, but if I don't know, then, <laughs> then I don't, but yes. <laughs> We, listen, we have put a lot of work into that very conversation over the past two, three years. Um, and I, I would encourage folks to do that with their own organizations because the first knee jerk, if you've never had this conversation with the board or the board starts having it with you is, oh, they're, they're thinking about changing my position, right? I'm on my way out. That's not the case. This is this is good governance. It's good practice for any organization. And for, in fact, it doesn't stop at the CEO. When we started with succession planning, it was across the board in this organization so that we, we lovingly call it alien abduction. If something happened, you know, if I get abducted by aliens, 
we can't we can't let the organization stumble if jill gets abducted we can't let those teams stumble so it's top down bottom up looking at skill sets succession planning who might be good in the event that that a leader leaves are we positioned to not stumble as we go forward for the ceo position look we can do all the planning that we have it'll ultimately be the board's decision at some point they may want to do a national search even though we have an heir apparent selected and then they'll feel better about that choice so it is a difficult conversation for the first conversation but it should become part of the routine of what an organization does yeah i agree with you i think it's it's one of those courageous conversations. It's so tough, but then once everybody kind of calms down a little bit, um, or if you're blessed to have a uh, board board members or board representation that's gone through this with other organizations, then you know it's a little bit more comfortable. But but I agree with you, Rita. You know, if anything, just COVID, the yes. lessons from that. I mean, where we literally had leaders pass away. You know, in my community, and I'm sure in your community, I mean, we've lost a million Americans. We've yeah. lost leadership. And then we have the aging out of our talent in C-suite. Um, it's it's kind of a confluence of opportunity for some people, if you will. So, yeah. Um, it's absolutely important. It's, it's worrisome at times. It shouldn't be. It shouldn't be. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. Well, Stephen, I hope that this helps you because it sounds like you're on this journey with your own organization. And again, you know, that can be one of those frightening things, but I have to say, and I'm sure you ladies would, you know, agree with me, what's more frightening is when you don't have this in place and then you're, you're crisis managing something that you could have really maybe uh, made it a lot easier or a lot tenable. And so it's it's just a, a stronger way to approach things because not everything stays the same, you know, nor, nor should it, nor should it. Well, this has been an amazing, amazing week. Um, I am always so inspired by your work from all across all levels. And I could go on and fangirl over this whole thing. But it's really a pleasure to see uh, in my world, everything from marketing and messaging, carrying through to leadership and action and policy. It's just brilliant. And I hope that more folks can look to the Dave Thomas Foundation for Adoption um, outside the purview of what it is your mission is, but just how you manage and structure. It's very, very powerful. And um, we don't have a lot of time, but. I'm very interested if there was something this week that you wished you had been able to say, but that you didn't get asked. I mean, I know this is a crazy busy time for you. You have a lot going on. This is a critical week for you, but was there something maybe that you missed or we missed? Nothing from my end. I would just, you know, if folks want to talk further, we love talking to people about the, the, the worlds of nonprofits. So if anybody wants to reach out, we're easy to find on the website. We'd be delighted to have further conversations. Awesome. Awesome. You know, before we let you go, Rita, you gave us some chilling numbers and I would ask for you to share that. So that's how we leave this week with the importance of statistically what's happening in our country. How many children are in foster care as we speak? As we speak, there are about 425,000 children who are in some kind of substitute care because of abuse or neglect or um, domestic violence, substance abuse, whatever it is that makes that home unsafe for that child. And of those children, 113,000 have been permanently separated from their family of origin. They're legal orphans in this country simply waiting for adoptive parents to step forward. Amazing. It's, it's a chilling number. Um, I don't think we can hear it enough because it's actually hard to to wrap our brain around. Um, I was working with a, a child uh, adoption advocate in, in our community, and she said, Julia, if you need a number, uh, if you need a way to process this number, we have enough children every single night in foster care that will fill our 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 NBA arena where the Phoenix Suns play. Yeah. Yep. We've and all kids. been there. We've all been yep. there. So you can sit in a chair and look around that stadium 
and in your mind shift it to the number of children just in my community and and so we need we need those links to reality and i appreciate you sharing that with us so that we can um understand the importance of this um, it has really been an honor to to have this time this is national adoption month and what's going to happen on saturday and tomorrow is national adoption day where courts and organizations open their doors and finalize adoptions of children for the past 22 years more than 75,000 children have had their adoptions finalized on national adoption day it's the it is the best um you you can't turn on the news and and not see this um i think rita you mentioned to me that you had somebody uh in the judicial system say that was his best day of being a judge yep absolutely. yeah it's really awesome well again we've had rita soren and president and ceo of the dave thomas foundation with us jill krumbacher senior vice president of marketing and you heard this correctly and development for the dave thomas foundation again i'm julia patrick and i have really been privileged to be uh alongside these great women they are amazing leaders you can follow both of them on social media particularly in linkedin where a lot of times they'll share their knowledge and sector knowledge um, of, as what they encounter and how they lead you can really see the, those those lines and it's i think a great way to learn how to be successful in a topic that can be really tough and sometimes that is one of those magic pieces that we don't talk about enough as, as how do we take a tough topic and make it better. So again, ladies, thank you so much. We want to thank Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, your part-time controller, Be Generous, Fundraising Academy at National University Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Thought Leader, and the Nonprofit Nerd. Okay, ladies, I know you have a busy day the, ahead of you and an even busier weekend. Thank you so much. Thank you, Julie. It's been great talking to you. It really has. Thank you. It's, oh my gosh, it's been amazing. We will um, convene and stalk you even more, I'm sure, <laughs> as we move forward. Stay warm, do well. And as we like to end every episode, we want to remind everyone, our viewers, our listeners, our guests, ourselves, to stay well so you can do well. And take adoption into your heart, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you.